The peace of the Lord be with you all. Shall we begin with the invocation on page one? Please stand as you're able. Blessed are all who make their beginnings and endings of all things to be in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We just deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may be delight in your will, would walk on in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my heart.
both body and soul, may cheerfully accomplish what you want done. Grant this through Jesus Christ, your Son. He is our Lord, living and reigning with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson from the book of Job, chapter 38. The Lord said to Job, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined the earth's measurements? Surely you know. Or who snatched the line upon it? Or who, or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors, when it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, and I prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors, and I said, Thus far shall you come and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth, and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal. Its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare, if you know all this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We speak the words of the gradual Psalm 34 together. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Continuing Paul's letter to the Romans and us, chapter 10. Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But the righteousness based on faith says, the word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear? without someone preaching. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. 
the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost! They cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And after Peter had had his little walk with the Lord and was back in the boat with all the others, there those in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the text. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and fellow disciples of St. John, it's curious, faith in our crucified and resurrected Lord inspiring us to trust we have a Heavenly Father so full of grace and mercy is often experienced as a joyous privilege lifts up our hearts. Then again, that same faith in Christ will also force us, make us endure situations of difficulty and unsettling responsibilities. That we share these with others is also seemingly Christ's intention. And then there are those moments when faith occasionally gets oneself into scary and lonesome troubles that are of our own making and doing. All three of these situations that disciples encounter in this world are what the promise of the Gospel this morning is about. Joyous privilege. The text in the Gospel starts out immediately after something. What was immediate? This was the same long day in which the disciples had witnessed Jesus 5,000 plus miracles for the crowd in the wilderness, fulfilled and satisfying all 5,000 plus with their fill of the five loaves and two fish that Jesus had blessed and given to the disciples to distribute, and then found that there were 12 baskets, one for each disciple left over for them to enjoy. Indeed, joyous participation of a privilege rarely few given the opportunity. But then immediately, no time to sit down and eat the dinner in peace. It says Jesus made the disciples get in the boat and sail off while he stayed behind, dismissing the crowd and going up on the mountain. Jesus made the disciples. The Greek here is force, push. He wasn't going to take no for an answer from them. And the question has to be why? What made the disciples so nervous as to embark on Jesus' command? Now we get to the difficult and unsettling responsibilities that we all share. Please remember Peter, James, John, and Andrew, four experienced fishermen who had spent their lives on the Sea of Galilee. And these four experienced fishermen read the age-old signs. Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in the morning, sailors warning. Now, that is a quaint proverb many of us may be acquainted with and not put much stock in as we don't too, too much in whatever the weather report is because we live in Chicago and it can change. But the point is, there is scientific verification to that adage. And I'll even do you one better. In two chapters from now, Jesus will quote this exact same principle when he chastises the Pharisees who demand Jesus give them a sign from heaven. Jesus looks at them and says, you read the colorations of the sky in the morning and the evening so you can tell what the weather is going to be, but you can't read me as the word of God's promises made flesh? Your arrogant demand to show you a sign is only indicative of what evil and adulterous hearts you have. So, red skies mean something to us as much as they apparently meant to Jesus. 
They are the telltale indications of what's coming. Meaning to say that Peter and the crew read the skies that morning and spent all day watching the potential for a storm was brewing. Yet as miracle filled as the day was, this evening voyage Jesus made them embark on was going to be a rough ride. They saw it coming. So when Jesus made them shove off, Whatever the eyes of their hearts had viewed Jesus as being the original miracle worker were now overruled by the eyes in their heads and their experienced judgment of what the skies told them. The storm is coming and you're going to be all by yourself. Skittish skepticism because not even Jesus was going to be around. This was not going to be any pleasure cruise. Get in a boat. Go. It is not by accident then that for centuries since, in the course of Christian history, a boat in stained glass windows and paintings have been the visual and literary metaphor for the church on earth as God's children moving through this world together. We whose hearts and minds are inspired by Jesus, cross and empty tomb, so promising God, the Father's constant grace and steadfast mercy. We find great joy in our loving and forgiving Lord's presence and the camaraderie of others who share this miraculous divine gifts of trust and anticipation that God's love is constant. His forgiveness in Christ revealed to be steadfast, a joyous privilege indeed. But here's the thing, this is not a privilege we earned or deserved or was begun and started by our choice. God the Father, and here I'm going to use a nautical visual for you, God the Father Shanghai each one of us into the church by the word of holy baptism. The Holy Spirit kidnapped each one of us out of the kingdom of sinful doubts, dreadful death, and satanic abuse, impressed us into the service of trusting the Lord because of the inspiration of Jesus' cross and open tomb. We sail through this world now as God's chosen crew. We all take our orders from Him, Whose, sin, whose death, resurrection, and ascension has so captivated our hearts with His love and forgiveness toward us that we now respond with loyalty, having made Him the captain of our souls. And through the wind and waves of this decayed and corrupt world, now this church sails. God has made his church to navigate waters that are neither serene nor placid, but must face the ongoing headwinds of sin, death, and the devil always blowing against us. There's days viral disease as well as real hurricanes bring death and destruction. Typhoons of injustice and homelessness and hunger stir up cyclones of fear and tempests of loneliness in our frenzied hearts and chaotic society. And into the teeth of these natural disasters and man-made squalls, God's people, the church, set sail. You can see it coming. We who bear the good news on account of Christ crucified and raised, revealing the Father's gracious and merciful presence to be with us, we who declare our loving and forgiving God to be with us, and so much so that we trust in Him to have taken the helm of our lives, that we are sailing through this world with the intention of bringing gracious words and merciful deeds to others in His name. Shanghai, we may be 
starting out in this cruise, but we have come to understand and embrace the understanding this is a noble, great commission our captain has given to us. And so we sail into the storms. With our confidence in him, though further springing leaks, when it seems our own sinful weaknesses and failures punch holes in the church, Our own internal bickerings. You could just hear the disciples. I told you we shouldn't have come. What are we doing out here? He made us. Arguing with selfish claims of command and control. You just hear Peter in the back of the boat trying to tell people what they're supposed to do. Or Matthew. He's a tax collector. What does he know? A sale from a tackle. The flimsy condition of our own personal immoral misbehavior, the imperfect efforts that we do in serving others, these are all the wind and the waves also blowing against our claims of success. All this during which important efforts to maintain our doctrinal integrity and pious reliabilities as necessary as they are can make it look like those in the church are arranging deck chairs on a sinking and soon to be some ship. To the world and often to ourselves, we are not all in the same boat of faith and hope in Jesus. There is not one holy Christian apostolic good ship church proclaiming the gospel and living the discipleship of carrying crosses of service in his name. We may think we are all Christians pulling together, but what the world sees is a flotilla of boats of all shapes and sizes called congregations that take the form of big rich yachts or luxury liners or little dinghies or leaky rowboats. And we're all competing for the same passengers who want to book their cruise to heaven based on whatever level of first class amenities any congregation offers that's going to make somebody's trip through this world as pleasurable as possible. So much so that for all of our religious efforts and pietistic endeavors, Jesus seems to become nothing more than a ghostly presence among us. When our hearts are afflicted with fears and stricken, by self-serving behavior, so as to look around and say, well, we really don't see any much of Jesus' physical presence, the best our doubts and suspicions can somehow generate is some sort of ghostly depiction of God with us. One who may not be dead, but he's certainly not much alive. Which, because that affects our faith and hope in him, makes us walk around like Christians who are not really sure if we're dead or alive in either one of sin or righteousness. Those are difficult, unsettling times. To that, added one more level of how scary and lonesome it can be for a disciple when they hear the Lord command them to do something and step outside of the church and go it alone in following that command. What the text points out in Peter's example is sometimes Christians can be lured into situations where they are overestimating their own faith as a sufficient reason to obey Jesus, that they jump ship into whatever place feeds their own egos. If it is you, Lord, Command me. It's interesting. Peter actually commands Jesus to command him back. That's where it's at. I order you, Jesus, to command me to come to you. Jesus says, come. Is this humble faith or misplaced cockiness? I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to tell apart, isn't it? 
Is this trusting meekness? Pure and simple, or is it tainted with a little bit of egotistical arrogance? You know Peter as well as I do from all the other places in which he shot off his mouth. And then there were those moments when he was grand in his proclaiming the gospel, like on that first day of Pentecost. Which one is this guy? The truth is, the difference only can be determined and emerges in when in conditions of stress and despair. And those terrifying earthly circumstances that lead us, who have made those kinds of decisions in hearing the Lord's command and stepping out in a direction that others are not wanting to go, and find ourselves in the quandary, has God either abandoned us totally? Or has it come just to be a creepy facsimile to us as well? Or the further we go along, the more we see what we're up against in the opposition that we must face, as well as listen to the crowd back in the boat going, Are you crazy? You can't go there! And that just capsizes the whole faith and hope thing. It is today, Christian, we give thanks that we hear from Jesus' own lips in those exact same moments that we experience. It is the Lord who will always say, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. He doesn't chastise the disciples. Ghost, what do you mean, ghost? He doesn't say to Peter, You made your bed lie in it, drown in it. No. Our God will always identify himself as the one who suffers and dies so as to crucify any fears that our own sufferings and death would ever separate us from him. He says, take heart. And we do take heart. Because this is the God who is with us and so reveal the power of him being with us by him giving us his heart. A heart that he gave when he died for the whole world. And a heart that is now raised and beating and continues to give himself to us. It is I. The Greek is actually translated, I am who I am. And any kid in Sunday school who's heard the story of Moses in the burning bush will recognize that is the name that God gave Moses. Who shall I say sent me? And God says, you go tell my people Israel. The God who is going to free them from Egypt and guide them into the promised land, that God's name is, I am who I am. It is in the church that the great it is I sounds out from every promise of God's word preached and taught and meditated upon. I am reveals himself to be with his people, not in some spiritual, supernatural seance, but by presenting his body and blood to us in, with, and under the wine and bread, so that every celebration of word and sacrament are how God promises in the midst of any storm, however fierce, my church, my crew will hear me not just say, I am who I am, but I am with you. Do not be afraid. We're all in the same boat. God's boat. The church. And one of those who have Peter's chutzpah and nerve to set out on a little personal voyage of faith on their own, following through on a scheme that they have designed as God is commanding me to take this course. What promise do they receive? Go ahead. Come on, Jesus says. But the Lord says it, knowing however bold we are and trusting in Him, and His command to do something, or not do something, the winds of our own imperfections will slam back into us 
the waves of our own self-righteousness will roll over us and we will sense ourselves sinking into an abyss of hopelessness. Threatening us, we're drowning, we're going to drown in our sinful nature's resignation. You know what? You deserve what you get. You never did have enough faith to be a success. Or realize the devil is tempting you to accuse your God of leading you into this scary situation and God is setting you up for the failure all along. Devil tempts us to the point we are up to our eyeballs in an ocean of bitter self judgments or judgments against God. The text doesn't say don't do this. The text simply says, is God's promise, it is my crew who keeps the weather eye out for those very things that will take place in your life when you do what I command you to do. And the promise of this morning's text is that whatever little faith in Christ and obeying Him that led us to step out and off into the direction that we have gone personally and individually. What little faith we have in the Christ who died and rose for us is going to lead us to echo Peter's cry, Lord, save me. You'll notice what Jesus says to him. Oh, you of little faith. He doesn't say, oh, you of no faith. There's always going to be enough faith left after all the doubts and uncertainties that God is with us. The Lord reached out his hand to Peter and caught him and lifted him up. Christ reaches out to us and lifts us up and leads us. Where does he lead Peter? It's a lot. He didn't take him off to the land and say, well done. Back in the boat, guy. Join the rest of the group, will you? However much we step out on our own, our own imperfections, our own failures, our own weaknesses, the things that cause whatever our noble goals were to suddenly come undone, it is when the Lord lifts us up and brings us back into the church, back into the boat. And what little faith we do still have in His crucified and risen Savior will also bring us back together. Keep us reaching out to Him as so then we can reach out to, other, to one another in this blessed union that is the church. And what are we doing here this morning in this little boat of St. John? What the guys were doing 2,000 years ago when the sea suddenly calmed and everything else that was going on in the world suddenly goes away. They worshiped him saying, truly you are the Son of God. And now what we're doing right now. There is a recognition historically that while John F. Kennedy was President of the United States, there was a little plaque that was sitting on his desk that had given it, been given to him by the, uh, one of the admirals in the Navy. And all it said is it's the Breton Fisherman's Prayer. I don't know if you ever heard of it. But it says simply, O God, thy sea is so great, and my boat is so small. That's our prayer. We are here to worship Him, to hear His voice communicate God's promises of grace and mercy, that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, risen and ascended, can commune with us in the gift of His Holy Supper. And we look outside and we see how great the turmoils are and how small this little boat of St. John's may be. But once again, the fellowship of the forgiven and the beloved have been rejoined and so they can rejoice. O oh, Captain, our Captain, 
your death and resurrection. That's all we need to navigate through the world's storms that we can sail on together on a voyage to life everlasting. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. There is a, another coupon that's included in your bulletins, and you are free to pick up as many as you would like to share. Our stewardship committee has arranged another fundraising opportunity, this time at Portillo's uh, at the end of the month of August. Um, this one, please note, is strictly drive-through. There is no need or opportunity to actually walk in and sit in the restaurant itself. So if you have that coupon and you make your uh, order available and aware of whoever takes it that you have that, a certain amount of benefit will come back to the uh, funds of our mission and ministry to carry on as best we can. Plug a few financial leaks here and there. Coupons are on the podium, not in the bulletins. Oh, they're not in the bulletins? Oh, I've been corrected. You won't find them in the bulletins, but they are on the podium as you picked up your bulletins. Please feel free to hold on to one and share one as you're able. Now for the offertory, let us sing Eternal Father, Strong to Save, verses one through four. You who have appointed all governments with the ability to rule, 
Grant that our own may so do in ways that will put injustice aside and distribute mercy throughout all the land. Be with those guarding our country with their lives, especially comfort the ones who mourn the loss of loved ones, strengthen those whose lives are changed by the wounds of war. Let every authority in this world use its power with equal justice tempered by unchanging mercy that we may live in peace and godliness with each other. Lord, in your mercy, you are our refuge and strength, O God, and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, your people will not fear, though the earth give way, the mountains fall into the sea, threatening winds of pandemic disease and menacing waves of loneliness roll over us. Yet the Holy Spirit of your gracious and merciful will Revealed in Jesus, so comforts our hearts and controls our minds. We will not grow weary, maintaining our vigilance, following the mandates that express love for our neighbors, even as we love ourselves. Sustain our health care workers in their vocations. Bless their efforts to prolong life and recover health. God, we've had so many make or break moments already during this epidemic. You have been with us through them all. So once more, we plead and call upon you, abide with us, come to us. So we are not afraid to face whatever comes. And so release from our fears, carry out our lives in obedience of faith to you and in loving service for all. Lord, in your mercy. Father, you know the needs of those who continue to suffer because of sickness, hospitalization, and hospice. Look with kindness upon all your servants whom we silently name in our hearts now. Take them by the hand and protect them from all doubt and uncertainty as to your steadfastly gracious mercy that continues to abide with them. And so strengthened by their faith in Jesus Christ, they wait patiently for you to use all medical means and heavenly resources that will grant them health, rest, relief, and peace. Lord, in your mercy, we shall present our sacrifices to you and commend into your hands now our petitions always trusting that you receive them with compassion and will graciously put them to use in ways that proclaim your gracious and forgiving reputation revealed in Jesus Christ throughout this congregation, throughout your church, out into the communities of the world as we invite others to join in our faith towards you and not for our sake, but Lord, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who has taught his disciples to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Faithful, Heavenly Father, I thank you with my whole heart, because you have taught me what it is you want that I shall believe and do. Now help me, my God, by your Holy Spirit, and for the sake of Jesus Christ, that I may keep your word in a pure heart, and by it be strengthened in my faith, and in righteous living purify myself. Let your word be my consolation in life and in death, so you grant me a portion in that eternal life, which is Christ Jesus, your Son, my Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, save your children, bless your inheritance, and protect your people by your cross. Now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. <laughs>